So welcome along to the Natural History Covered podcast, episode one. Uh, I'm Gareth, I'm your host, uh, and along with, alongside me is my uh, two other co-hosts. Uh, we've got uh, Aaron, say hello. Hello. <laughs> and we've got Drew as well, uh, also say hello. I, th I thought you weren't going to ask. Hello. Oh, well, <laughs> you, do, you do get mentioned. <laughs> So um, this podcast uh, is basically uh, going to be uh, everything to do with um, nature, science, natural history, pretty much anything and everything that we uh, find interesting. Uh, then we'll end up rambling on about it for a bit uh, and then uh, finding other bizarre things to talk about as well. Um, so uh, let's get into our first segment uh, that we're going to be doing. Uh, and that is the news segment. Okay, so we're in with our first segment, we're into the news. So today on the news, we've got everything from cocaine hippos to giant beasts stalking Cheshire uh, and even statues for uh, beloved paleontologists. Um, so let's, let's, let's start it out with, uh, with you, Aaron. What's, um, what's been stalking Cheshire? Plot thickens, not just Cheshire. But anyway, we have a suspected big cat. Ah. As there always is. <laughs> Britain. Uh, so, yes, um, a Cheshire man who wanted to only be known as Gareth. Uh, it's got nothing to do with me, I'd like to point out. <laughs> um, mm. Claims that he spotted this mystery creature less than a mile from the attraction of Chester Zoo on Plas Newton Lane I'm probably butchering that name in Upton, Chester I uh, spotted it around 2.30 in the morning on Thursday February 4th 2.30 um, immediately... in the morning? 2.30 in the morning That's fair enough mm. quite early well, That's we'll prime time a yeah. I can hear what you're thinking we'll get on to it in a minute uh, So on the morning of 2.30 is in the morning of Thursday, February 4th, um, Gareth, who did not want to give his surname, uh, contacted Puma Watch North Wales, a group that kind of specialises in documenting sightings. Uh, he described the animal as a big black cat. Um, he was driving along and he saw it at the side of the road near a hedgerow. So that is what he saw. Now, Ches I'm getting this from Cheshire Live. Uh, online, who then approached Chester Zoo. Uh, to uh, Were they missing anything at the time? No, that's what they... <laughs> that's what he said. So a spokesperson for Chester Zoo said, the cat you've mentioned is not from Chester Zoo. Yeah, so that we'll, we'll go count. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sort of thing that most zoos do tend to, uh, to yeah, yeah. get a little bit worried about if they're missing a large cat. Yes, and I imagine like they, a, a few of them get contacted quite often by uh, these people. Anyway, the, the plot thickens because this news comes as another Chester resident uh, who did give his surname, his name is Graham Calvert, sent in a video of what he suspected to be a big cat. Now, he wasn't in Cheshire at the time. This is the video that we all watched earlier on. Uh, you can find it on Cheshire Live online. Uh, Mr. Calvert sent in uh, this video of Shropshire Canal in Stoke. So uh, quite a distance away from... From where he was, uh, the other guy was in Chester. Yeah, mm. where he was walking his dog and he saw an animal in the distance. Now, this, there's no polite way of putting this. This even <laughs> wildlife untrained eye is quite clearly a fox. Uh, now, Graham <laughs> Calvert is adamant that what he saw is not a fox, but this video, and what I'd like to. It's, well, it's a good job he's got that video there to prove that what he saw is not a fox. <laughs> It is a good job. What I always wonder is why do people, what, in today's modern era of technology, when you've got these wonderful cameras with 6,100 infinite pixels on them, uh, even if you're not carrying a proper camcorder or a proper camera, your phone can take really good photos. So why are we still in 2021 getting really grainy, shoddy footage? Of these animals. Uh, now there is one explanation. Maybe it was from. I, I like to think it's the uh, the Bigfoot paradox sort of thing. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. It always appears in very grainy, misty areas of. Uh... Got like a sort of natural. Plus, also, he's you know he's he's looking at a big cat. He's panicking. Uh, I mean, a little the bit. Cameras yes. all over the place. Should be yeah. should be panicking a little bit, especially if it is a big cat. For the yeah, for I mean, of... if it is a big cat, he really shouldn't be hanging around. If anything, <laughs> should just walk away instead of taking some grainy footage of it. I do appreciate that he might have been at quite a distance, and so zooming in on your phone camera uh, could could cause a great. Oh, I see. We're giving benefit of the doubt, are we? <laughs> yeah, we're benefit of the doubt. Got to However, give him the benefit of the doubt. Gonna, the we're going to turn the benefit of the doubt on its head now because the fox. Sorry, the cat. <laughs> <laughs> that might have just given away <laughs> your presupposition as to what the animal might actually be. Oh, you already we're, said fox. Yeah. He walked past the fence. He walked past the fence line. And there's some like there's some bushing in the in the foreground and stuff, and you can quite see quite easily see from scale that this is not a big animal. Secondly, the rusty red coat <laughs> and the bushy tail with a white patch on the end does give it away a little. And the snout. I mean, even I, what we did just so that anyone that hears this can understand this. So I showed Gareth and Drew this through a Facebook chat video call so it was grainy through my phone watching a grainy video on my laptop and we could still see that it was a fox yeah um, it was it was somewhat conclusive um yeah the best part is yet to come he said while while it was roughly the size of a fox <laughs> and skeptics may point out the white end on the tail mm. it was the animal think of flattened muzzle that convinced him it must be feline um I mean, if if you're looking at something at a distance where your phone camera can't pick it up clearly, I'm afraid that you could be missed seeing it. A bit like the actual story, the big cat near Chester Zoo. This guy saw it at two thirty in the morning. It's like it's dark. You're not. I I don't. I'm not convinced. Anyway, he got in touch with Ches Cheshire Live as well after reading a previous article about a reported big cat sighting in, in Whitby Park in Ellesmere Port, uh, which is obviously that that direction. Well, Ellesmere Port's over towards Liverpool, so this is quite a large range we've gone for. Mm. Yes, uh, and that incident was said to have taken place earlier this month, whilst Mr Calvert's sighting was back in January. But anyway... The woman who gave her name to Puma Watch North Wales as Carol said that on Monday, February 1st, a large cat-like animal standing about six to eight feet away from her was on the opposite side of the fence at a tennis court. I thought she was going to say it was six to eight feet tall. <laughs> well, this is, this is brilliant. So she described the mysterious creature as cat-like with short hair and a bushy tail and slender. Mm. Also sounding very fox-like. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, the, there are there are some credible sightings of definitely things that may be big cats that have happened every now and again, but ninety nine percent, I would say, are very much people not being able to identify. A yeah, yeah, and it's for perspective. Even yeah, if that, or you see these animals at a distance. You, the human mind is not good at accurately figuring out size when it's a distance away there's one i think it was in essex on a train track that it was a domestic cat but you could see where they went uh what why they went that direction when it stood on a, a train track we in fact there's not there's a zoo not very far away from where we're all sitting uh that has a big board up about different big cat sightings across the southwest yeah that's true um and the, the issue, everybody seems to go back to the whole, in 1972, I think it was, or 73, the Dangerous Wild Animals Act came in. Before then, it was not common, but somewhat common to have these big exotic cats. And then this this legislation came, came out, and people didn't want their animals put down, but they couldn't afford to have them rehomed, or couldn't afford to, to get the... the get the license in for themselves because uh, it ha it's not just getting the license, it's also proven that you can house them and look after them correctly. And there are stories which are probably credible of um, people picking them out onto the moors, such as Bodmin, Exmoor and Dartmoor. Um, and they, like I say, that origin story is probably very credible. 
However, there would not have been enough of them across the British Isles. There would not have been enough of them for them to sustain a population for 2021. Um, so I am, um, as much as I love the idea of a leopard, a lynx or a cougar stalking around the uh, countryside, uh, completely unknown to anyone, I love the idea of it. And make no mistake, it will be those three species because the others are not going to survive here long. And they're much bigger as well. They're not going to find it... Much easier to spot, I'd say. Mm. Yeah, they're far more difficult to hide. And plus these three, Ivan, like the lynx is naturally supposed to be here. But the other two, they come from a wide ranging habitat. They're incredibly adaptive animals. So if there was enough of the initial population to breed till now, maybe. But there just wasn't. And there's not enough. There's not enough evidence um, to suggest that there were. So I am, like I say, as much as I'd love the idea of it, like it's not looking like it's going to have happened. Then. And every time you see videos of it, there's never anything clear. Uh, it's always grainy, at a distance, dark. And there's always it's, it's like ghost stories. You, <laughs> you always see a ghost when you wake up in the middle of the night and it's at the end of your bed, and you're knackered and there's no lights on. I mean, I haven't seen too many ghosts at the end of my bed, but I'll go with you on that. Yeah, yeah. It sounds, <laughs> sounds very much likely. So we'll move on from mysterious big cats that are probably just normal sized foxes to uh, to cocaine hippos with you, Drew. Cocaine what? hippos. So, <laughs> yes, uh, as I'm sure most people would know, this refers to hippos in Colombia, which used to belong to Pablo Escobar, uh, who had yeah, his... Hippos. Obviously, yeah. don't come from Colombia. No. no. Would it be beneficial to point that out? Well, just just in case, it's always worth uh, letting people know. I suppose so. Yeah. So they're they're obviously not found in Colombia because Colombia is in South America, and hippos are famously from uh, from Africa. So Pablo Escobar had a menagerie of a few animals. Uh, the hippos are the sort of the most notorious ones, um, and I'm referencing a news article. Uh, on BBC News, so readily accessible, um, of basically why scientists want to cull those uh, hippos in, in Colombia, uh, because obviously they're not a native species. Um, so, uh, so yeah, like I say, they're gone. Uh, is, is Pablo Escobar, um, just explain for those, because I'm not 100%, I know that he was a, a drug lord, but that was pretty much all I was aware of him. What? What connection has he got with with hippos? Uh, he, I, I think he used to hide drugs in them, and that's how he got them uh, across. <laughs> I think that's how he got them across the border uh, out in uh, out, out to the US. I'm fairly sure. I'm pretty sure it's accurate. I've heard, I've, I've heard of drug mules before, but I've never heard of drug hippos. <laughs> it's, it's where the uh, it's where the word, the word comes from actually, because they put little <laughs> they put little rabbit ears on their on their heads. It looks like a, them look a big like fat mules. a big fat mule coming off. Um, so he's, he is the uh, one of the most notorious criminal uh, drug criminals of all time, uh, uh, but well, just just a criminal of all time. Um, and he's also the uh, founder of the infamous Medellin drugs cartel in the 1980s. Uh, he was responsible for kidnappings, bombings, and indiscriminate assassinations, uh, and uh, putting nice drugs guy, drugs in hippos. Um, <laughs> and at one point, he was thought to be one of the world's richest men, uh, but he was. Uh, well, should we say he was taken down, um, but the hippos basically still remained uh, on on his estate, um, and they have grown in number. So they, yeah, they were there since uh, probably like mid nineteen eighties or so, uh, and obviously they've just increased and increased in number. Uh, they reckon that there might be around eighty to one hundred and twenty animals there now. Uh, and it's also said to be the biggest ha uh, hippo herd outside of Africa. Um, I so, can't imagine there aren't many herds of hippos outside of Africa. I can't imagine there are either. Uh, so yeah, there's 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 not so uh, not so. They're not your average. For them. No, um, this article also. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this article also interestingly does actually feature some hip uh, some pictures of the hippos, and unlike our previous article, they're really clear. Uh, I can see <laughs> I can see two hippos here. Um, they're having a fight, uh, and that's quite clearly a hippo. Uh, Fair enough. So yeah, if uh, if you want to reference this article, just to get an idea of what you, what a hippo looks like and not what a uh, a blurred fox looks like, uh, come and check this one out. It will give you a 
a nice good shot of what a hippo looks like. Um, but yeah, they're talking about uh, culling these hippos because, of course, like I said, they're not uh, they're not native to this area, uh, not native to Colombia at all, um, and they are causing a bit of devastation to uh, that ecosystem um, by essentially not being native to it. So uh, there's a worry that they are eating um, uh, eating the same sort of plants that manatees would be eating. Um, so obviously they would affect their numbers, um, and apparently they're altering the chemical composition of waterways as well, which could endanger. Uh, some fisheries too. Um, is that because of the way that hippos basically spray their poo everywhere? Yeah, I, I, I would guess so. There is a link here, actually. I haven't actually clicked on it yet. That would uh, that suggests um, why they would actually they might help the environment there. Um, but yeah, feel free to have a have a little click on that. I might have a click on it and uh, uh, and see what's on there in a second. Um, but yeah, the, it, I imagine it's because they make a lot of mess. They're mammals. They make a lot of mess. <laughs> so they're talking about culling them. This, of course, is a bit of a polarizing issue, um, as with any any culls, uh, even the ones that we have here in the UK, uh, because they're very, very popular in Colombia. Uh, the general sort of populace really likes these hippos. They really like going to visit them. Um, there's a picture here of some Colombians uh, throwing carrots. I don't know what that is, but they're throwing, they're throwing some food towards the hippo. He seems to be having a good time. Uh, I don't know if this one's in a zoo though, because he looks like he's in, he's slightly enclosed. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very I mean, unpopular. You'd, you'd, want, you'd want fences up between you and a hippo, pretty much anyway. They are by far one of the most dangerous animals in all of Africa, and presumably these Colombian ones are also quite dangerous well, as well. They're full of drugs. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to keep. I'm pretty sure Colombia has moved on, moved uh, quite far away from that now. I don't want to keep uh, repeating that it's uh, well. It make, it's well yeah. known for it. Um, maybe it's satirical now. Who knows? Who knows there? Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be you, fair, you this hope hippos, you hope the hippos would have kicked the habit by now. Well, you would have hoped. Uh, I mean, you don't know what's what's out there in the wild, though, do you? Really? Well, that's we, true. we don't know everything. The one of the most dangerous. How do you smuggle drugs in one of the most dangerous animals on the planet? Very carefully. Uh, boom, boom. There may be a not safe for work article. Uh, on that on this page as well <laughs> i'll have a look i might have a look in a bit later to see if i can find the uh, uh how they would do that with uh with videos hopefully uh but yeah the picture of this uh, of this hippo here the uh, the fence isn't it looks slightly barbed but it's not it's not great i reckon if he wanted to he could probably get through that um but yeah like i say it's a polarizing issue just like uh, just like culling is all all across the world when uh, uh when scientists and biologists are talking about um, how they should call uh, an invasive species. Um, there has been news of them wanting to start culling the ringneck parakeets that we have here in the UK uh, because they're, mm. well, also invasive. They're, they're flocking this way. There's lots of them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're, I think they're as far north as Manchester as well now, aren't they? But... As, as, well, they're just they're quite good in urban areas. Yeah, exactly. And people feed them. And obviously they're really popular the, because. The, like... The slight difference being ringneck parrots, they land in your garden. It's not such a bad idea. You know, no. hippo comes into your garden. You're going to know about it. Well, also, the ringneck parrots have, they, they do have a predator here. They, they have the, uh, I believe, uh, is it peregrine falcons in London that hunt them? They, um, they take them in, in, the, uh, uh, in the wild. However, yeah. we do have issues here because obviously we don't have wolves, bears and lynx anymore. Um, our largest predators are uh, big cats, actually. I think you'll find we've got one <laughs> <laughs> big cats that wear foxes' clothing. Hey, claw, uh, of course, um, yeah. So, we we don't have predators, predators here, and but we have a large variety of introduced invasive species over here. Uh -huh. Uh, but I can't imagine there's uh, once you've got an adult. Once you're a hippo at adulthood, there ain't anything that's going to take you out. Not much that touches you, no. No, no. There are, yeah. They, that's obviously a big issue as well because they don't have any natural predators in uh, in South uh, in South America, um, and even in Africa. Once they're fully grown, there's not really much that's that's going to tackle a hippo. Um, but yeah, I feel like a lot of people over here wouldn't appreciate the extent of damage to an ecosystem that a invasive species does because people see rabbits or pheasants and they just think oh that's that's cute or that's beautiful and move on with their day mm. but these animals do 
fill niches and sometimes outcompete animals that should be being seen in our in our countryside. Yeah. Like you said about the um the manatees. Yes, there, yeah. That share the same food with the hippos. Well, if they're impacting where the manatees are, they're they're far more an in, endangered species in in their habitat <laughs> there than uh, than what a hippo will be. So yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, on the subject of pheasants as well, did you know? that half of the UK's bird population is actually game birds. Uh, I did not. Been released. So half, not. yeah, half of our entire bird population is uh, are all in, uh, all invasive species. That's kind of sad. Yeah, we're, we, sad. We, we do like, we do like releasing them and they, and they cause a lot of damage, just like these hippos I imagine are doing uh, to their ecosystems. And uh, yeah, because they're <laughs> such big animals, I imagine they're, I imagine uh, the impact that they're making is, is quite significant, even though there is only about 120 uh, maximum of them. Hmm. Well, hopefully they'll end up doing something about that uh, for them in, in the future. Um, yeah. And we'll move on to our final news article, uh, which is, uh, is me. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, mine's a good bit of news. It's, it's a good bit of news. No mysterious creatures, no cocaine hippos. Uh, mine's all about um, the famous paleontologist Mary Anning. Um, she's the, uh, well, she's a very famous British paleontologist who really didn't get her her dues, as it were, in her time because the Victorian era and she was a woman. So, you know, it didn't really matter what she said, did or anything. She was pretty much pushed aside by the uh, by the establishment. By men. As it was at the time. By men. <laughs> yes, yeah. We are, we are horrible. Uh, but uh, in Lyme Regis, where Mary Anning was born, which is a really famous fossil hunting site, where she found most of the, uh, the things she's found. She found everything from the first fossil uh, pterosaur, um, the flying reptiles that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. Uh, she also found multiple ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, ammonites, all sorts of different things. And uh, in fact, if you go to the Natural History Museum in London, there's an entire gallery of some of the stuff that she found, and it is truly stunning, the stuff that she's found. I've gone fossil hunting on that beach multiple times and never found anything anywhere near as good. Did you see her? Um, did I see her? Unfortunately, I haven't got a time machine. Um, she is. She has been dead for about 200 years, so, oh, right. you know, just missed her. Just missed her. Okay. Um, but the, uh, the Mary Anning Rocks campaign, which has been a, uh, a group that's, that's set up uh, a goal to try and raise a hundred thousand um, pounds to build a Mary Anning statue because the town itself has got very little up about Mary Anning, which is a bit crazy, really, for someone who was that famous and made such a dent on uh, on science. There's nothing about her, really. Um, it's it's really kind of sad. Uh-huh. So uh, a local uh, a local girl um, of What's her name? Uh, Evie Swire questioned why there was no uh, memorial to uh, to Mary Anning, uh, and they started a fundraising campaign, um, and it just hit its target the other day of a hundred thousand pounds. In That's... fact, it's now going sort of over that, and they're going to try and raise uh, enough funds to be able to have sort of a, a virtual walk around Lyme Regis, pointing out all the different. Uh, sites where she lived oh that's cool um and and worked and everything so using like qr codes so you'd be able to follow it with your phone um and find all these different places on sort of a virtual map so that's that's a pretty cool thing yeah Yeah, that is cool the the stat the statue itself is going to be of her and her dog um basically walking with towards the beach presumably i don't think they've even figured out whether it's going to go yet or or anything, but it's at least got all the funding it needs, and hopefully will um, will be on its way soon. So that's kind of cool. What's the scale they're going for, Gareth? Because I remember before Verity was unleashed in Ilfracombe on, on the half down there, <laughs> they were they were saying, "Oh, it's it's going to be North Devon's own Colossus of Rhodes." It's it's really not. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> think they're going for the Mary Anning Colossus. Um, there's no, there's nothing about scale, but I think it's going to be one to one. So it's basically just a, a normal sized statue of a person walking with their dog. What? what they, sorry, what are they making out? Uh, making it out from? Just stone. I think it is. I think it's going to be bronze. Oh, from bronze. Okay. From the, 
yeah, oh. from the way it's going to uh, you can, being being portrayed. You can go big with bronze. I'm sure you can. Um, that would look I very it would odd. If they did it out of stone. She worked in stone. Make make it make out, it out of, of fossils. You, you, you can get in contact with the uh, the Mary Anning Rocks people and, and see if you can change their this, mind. As to whether disassemble a dinosaur. Make Mary Anning. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> oh, just, someone who... It was just a dinosaur that no one likes, Gareth, like uh, the Spinosaurus or something. <laughs> as someone who really both likes fossils and, and Spinosaurus, uh, I, I'm kind of against that as an idea. But um, it's really good to see someone getting... The recognition that they very much didn't get in life. Um, oh, she had a bit of a, a, a raw deal when it came to uh, to things. She, if I remember correctly, her dog got crushed in a landslide. Well, I was callous. Uh, I think I think her father got uh, seriously ill. She then died when she was about forty or fifty. It it was uh, it's it's your classic sort of Victorian sort of um, tale where. Everything's depressing, and probably there's smog everywhere if you were to film it. Yeah, know? if I think about going in back in time and, and sort of areas that I'd like to live, Victorians really feature pretty low on that list, yeah. because I, it, it, they were an awful like... period. I know there's lots of discoveries <laughs> and stuff, and we were, le we were learning lots of things, and obviously there needs to be lots of ironing out, but Jesus, did they iron. <laughs> Well, I believe even even better. There, I believe there is a Mary Anning film that is coming out yes, as well. So there that's is. Cool. That's cool. That was filmed. Uh, I believe uh, some of the filming was done for that about two years ago. Thankfully, just before COVID and everything uh, hit. Isn't that Kate Winslet? So, uh, is it Kate Winslet? I think it might be. Yeah, I yeah. think it might be. Well, I think I've heard of this. Yeah. So hopefully that will come out soon, and we can um, we can well see a bit more about Mary Anning and. and more people will be aware of her. Absolutely, but uh, and hopefully a statue yeah. will come will come along soon. Maybe Colossus of Rhodes. Size, Maybe but, you know, let's hope so. I would like when they when that's all finished. I'm sure it'd be on Facebook and on the news and stuff. So I'll make a trip down there and yeah. have a look at that. Uh, exactly. How much was this actually going to be again? Sorry. Well, they raised a hundred thousand pounds. I don't think it's all going to be for that. Some of it will probably be for planning and all sorts of ridiculous red tape but they got their they got their uh, total and they're getting more every day so there is a campaign now to raise uh, up to uh, 50,000 pounds extra to like I say um, come up with the uh, Mary running uh, Mary Anning rocks learning legacy which would be that, uh, Did you say that again? Tour around like probably not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the statue going to be positioned? Like, uh, in, it, in... it doesn't say at the moment, but probably somewhere right. fairly prominent in Lyme Regis. It's not a massive town, Lyme Regis, but it's um, it's it's got a few areas that I could imagine it will probably end up. Hmm. Yeah. So that's all yeah, of but... our news articles for the moment, then. And we'll move on to our next section, uh, which is going to be our creature feature. And this week, we're looking at by far one of the most disturbing fish that you've probably heard about, but has probably come across in a very, very odd manner, and that's the kandaroo. Right, well, welcome to our creature feature. This segment, we're going to be looking at one particular animal, um, or uh, a group of animals, and their more bizarre sort of features. This week, to start things off, I thought I'd choose possibly one of the oddest and, well, just sort of has one of the most gruesome reputations uh, <laughs> of an animal that you could possibly find, and that's the kandaroo. Uh, are you two familiar with the kandaroo? Uh, yeah, vaguely. Gruesome <laughs> reputation. <laughs> the old pee, pee fish, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kangaroo that we're going to be talking about, there's two species um, that are actually very unrelated to each other, but both have the name kangaroo. Both of them are absolutely fascinating for disgusting reasons. The one that you're thinking of, the kangaroo, um, that everyone uh, says gets into your, uh, your nether regions, um, is... <laughs> is uh, Vandelia serosa, 
Um, it's not a very big fish. In fact, it's only about um, five to six centimeters long. Uh, and it's a member of the toothpick catfishes. Uh, and they live uh, in the Amazon, basically in any murky water. And supposedly they like to sneak up on you if you're peeing in the river and lodge themselves up inside of your urethra. But when you start digging into these fish, not or literal, when they start digging into you, or when they start <laughs> digging into you, yeah, you start to realise there's actually there's not so much uh, exact truth to these uh, these these rumours. Um, in fact, the rumours themselves go back hundreds of years, and it's probably got more to do with the fact that. When people went to the Amazon first off and started uh, traipsing around and, and <clears throat> looking at the uh, the wildlife, they didn't actually speak a word of any of the um, the languages of people who lived there, and so basically very badly interpreted everything and anything that these people were saying, and just sort of filled in the blanks as best they could. Um, the first report of a supposed attack was by a German uh, biologist uh, called C. F. von uh, von Mauritius. Uh, and in 1829, um, he didn't actually see it happen. And this is where it starts to get all sort of, I knew someone who knew someone who knew someone sort of style of an account. Oh. Uh, it was told by natives <laughs> that they would quite often tie ligatures or like groups of reeds around their, uh, their genitals to basically stop the fish before they went swimming. Um, and to, to basically make sure that these fish didn't uh, somehow get to them whilst they were swimming. Um, but at the same time, he also supposedly was told by these natives that a group of them came across an entire tribe where all of the men had their genitals cut off in basic preparation to make sure that if they went in the water, they would not get attacked, which seems a little bit counterproductive if you ask me. I don't know about you two. Well, it makes perfect sense for that tribe to still be going. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, so it's not they... very. They weren't a very long-lived tribe, apparently. Um, if no. they ever existed. <laughs> well, like taking off your 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 John Thomas uh, <laughs> is is there's a lot of blood flow in that area. Yes, uh, and lopping it off is always incredibly dangerous. Like when they when they used to. Uh, sounds like something uh, you've looked into. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, I don't know if the word "make" is correct here, but when they made eunuchs, or yeah, uh, it was sort of maybe fifty-fifty whether they would actually survive the the whole process. <laughs> Fair so, enough. No, no, uh, no, no fish involved in in making a eunuch either. I generally no, I don't think so. I don't think there were any of those peepee -pee fish <laughs> in the uh, around the Mediterranean or so where they used to make them. I think we can burst this myth pretty much with one question, and that is, how wide are these fish? You told us how long they are, but how they wide said, are they? They said they were quite thin. This, this, gets, this gets to the, the root of the, uh, the supposed thing. So um, the, the fish themselves naturally don't like to stick themselves into people's ure uh, urethras because, believe it, why, <laughs> Someone's why? It in them, is it? <laughs> believe it or not, that is not a normal place for a fish to hide. Um, mm. They actually spend most of their lives feeding off the blood. Have you got a citation for that? <laughs> I unfortunately don't have a citation for that. Uh, for the rest of it, I do. Um, All right. So they um, they feed off the blood of uh, of the fish in the Amazon, and they get in uh, to the uh, the gill rakers it, uh, in in underneath the uh, the gills of the fish and attach onto the sort of fleshy um, areas and basically feed off the blood. So um, they're so haemophagus. They Essentially, yeah, they're vampires. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> they basically it's a good they word. It's a good word. Um, and they're attracted to the fish themselves by the, um, the, the sort of chemical signature that the fish leave behind in the water. And thankfully, the Amazon is very, very murky, so they can sneak up on a lot of fish when they're sort of at rest and then get in fairly unnoticed and basically feed off those fish. Hmm. So that's their natural state, their natural habitat. But the most credible, and I say credible whilst doing the biggest air quotes that I can possibly do, um, <laughs> is apparently happened in 1997. 
a Brazilian uh, man claimed uh, whilst he was um, well near the near the uh, the river, he basically went uh, to pee, and as he uh, he peed into the water, this fish in his own words, jumped out of the water and up his urine stream straight into his urethra. <laughs> did, it cl- did it climb the like urine a, stream? Like a porpoise. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> a porpoise some sort of salmon porpoise hybrid sort of uh, jumping motion. So, you know, it's already sounding a little dubious. And when you look into the, the physics of how water works in what's called laminar flow, which is essentially how pee works when it's coming out, um, the fish would not be able to swim up this strength uh, like of, of, of urine stream. It just wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, but supposedly this fish got lodged inside of his urethra and he actually had surgery to remove it. Mm-hmm. Now, the <laughs> surgeon who supposedly removed this has video of the, uh, the procedure, uh, him removing it via an endoscope. Uh, and essentially cutting the fish into sort of bits to pull it out. It has three barbed <laughs> spines, one on each one of its pectoral fins, the ones on the side, its arms, basically, yeah. and then one on its, um, its, its fin on the top of its body, its dorsal fin, uh, and that basically helps to lodge it in place, a bit like a, it's a, a little, spike. That... It's a little cow trap. Yeah, yeah. A little cow trap mm. fish. Essentially, essentially, it sits there, and it, it, you know, so supposedly this is inside of this guy's urethra who is supposedly in a lot of pain. I imagine it probably would be very, very painful. Um, so he has this fish removed um, from this in this procedure. They then actually, the surgeon apparently kept the fish afterwards in a jar and it sat in the medical, uh, sorry, in, in the, um, the University uh, of Manaus um, uh, ichthyology department where basically it was a room full of loads and loads of jars. And if you look it up, um, you can actually find an episode of um, oh, River Monsters, that's the, uh, the, the show, mm. uh, where the guy goes around and catches lots of different fish. Uh, and essentially, he takes the same guy who supposedly this happened to, to this uh, department and shows him the fish in the jar. <laughs> and this is a, sort of a weird reunion thing that they did where <laughs> they went, here is the fish By which supposedly it's, it's, it's like, like a flash- criminal like flashbacks. <laughs> it's supposedly it's yeah. like, the fish probably happened to the it was like mom. tell me where the fish touched you <laughs> <laughs> well the only problem with this and you can see that the uh, the presenter is actually very very dubious to a, an extent is that the fish is perfectly intact which he none said of the spines was cut are removed. up yeah <gasps> none of the spines are removed and uh, it's looking like a totally different fish. Oh, the I game's can link over. This back, yeah. I can link this back to my story in Cheshire earlier on. <laughs> it's not a fox, no. No, it's but not. the big cats, farmers, are they known for that? Farmers were known at one stage in our lifetime to mutilate sheep and then put them up trees and then call, pretend. basically call the relevant parties to pretend that uh, the their sheep have been taken by uh, leopards. Big cat. Uh, well, I don't think it was a leopard responsible for this. No, no, no. But no. Um, <laughs> essentially... <laughs> no, you'd know, if you, you'd know if you had a leopard up there. <laughs> well, you don't want a leopard. Also, there, it's yeah. the Amazon. Well, yeah, it's going to be a jaguar up there, isn't it? Um, so, essentially, the... Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't really uh, seem plausible. And probably the biggest thing is... The fish themselves are actually wider by quite a bit than a human urethra. Well, talk for case yourself, closed. Right? Case closed. If this fish has managed to do this, it's not only rocketed up some urine, which is very unlikely to do in the first place, Yeah. launched itself at such velocity that it's managed to uh, lodge itself inside of a human urethra. This guy must have fallen over at some speed or something. Because essentially it would be like a small water bullet <laughs> that comes at you. So um, unfortunately, the myth of them doing that is is very much just that. Just to myth. clarify, you did just say that unfortunately that is not true. <laughs> well, yeah, because I'd love these sort of stories to be true for the simple reason it would it would just be another one of those absolutely bizarre things. It's kind of sad when some of these these things you find out are totally and utterly non you know uh, non reality. It's uh, it's kind of sad, but when you look into a distant cousin of theirs, it gets even better. 
because their distant cousin, <clears throat> the Kandaru Asu, which uh, is a, a member of the whale catfishes, that uh, doesn't mean it's the size of a whale. In fact, they're only about sort of six inches long. They don't lodge themselves inside of your uh, urethra, but they do something far more disgusting. Um, oh, they are the, 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 these, these are by far... Are oh, these the far... bullet holes? Oh, yes. Uh, We're getting to the bullet yes. This is not a gun-wielding catfish, but um, <laughs> the Kandaru are sued. Compared um, to the other gun-wielding catfishes. <laughs> the stupid kandaroo um, is uh, basically it's kandaroo um, it gets the name kandaroo because that seems to be a sort of a common name for the, the area I couldn't actually find what kandaroo means uh, simply because the actual word is in um, the Tupi language and unfortunately I can't speak Tupi uh, you could go on, uh, you as... could go on a, a quick uh, shout out to Wiktionary go on that and, uh, Wiktionary. Wiktionary yeah Pretty good. I might have to look that one up in the future have a look at it. Uh, to, to find out what it was. But for for all of the looking that I did, I could not find the meaning of the word kandaloo. But essentially, as as you were saying, Aaron, um, bullet holes come into this. So these are a fish that have a rasping sort of set of teeth, and they will find corpses. They've got an exceedingly good sense of smell, like all members of the catfish family. They've got uh, an exceedingly good set of, uh, sense of smell. They don't really need uh, any other senses. And in fact, their eyes are quite reduced. They're not blind, but they certainly don't need it for the simple reason the Amazon is very, very murky. <clears throat> but they will find corpses of animals that have fallen into the river and they'll start to bore into them. And you don't just get one fish doing this. You get 40 or 50 of these uh, kandaroo, all about six inches long, boring into the side of an animal. And reports uh, that have been verified have been uh, people who've been drunk late at night and fallen into the river and drowned, or someone who's been shot uh, and has just dropped into the river and, and been found the, the day later. They brought these bodies into the, the local morgue, and it looks like they've been riddled with bullet holes from like a, a solid... Uh, slug shotgun shell mm -hmm. um, except when they open them up they then find that their entire chest cavity is empty apart from writhing masses <laughs> of these fish <laughs> and essentially what they've done is they've bored their way in and eaten everything on the inside which is pretty disgusting when you uh, when you see them moving because it is this big ball of pink uh, six inch long fish just basically squirming around inside so it's not what it's not something to watch for the uh the i think that's heart. resourceful you imagine a uh, <laughs> slipknot concert from about a mile above <laughs> that's probably what it looks like i've never been to a slipknot concert but i'll I, take your I, word I for it as well who <laughs> looks like that yeah well you know like that yeah. rife in pulsing kind of movement fair enough any any slipknot fans <laughs> With me oh, and disrespect the that you're uh, that you're uh, that you're a bunch of writhing catfish, um, <laughs> they essentially are a clean up crew Ooh. for the uh, uh, for the um, the Amazon. Uh, they'll eat pretty much anything and everything that they come across, uh, corpse wise, uh, and we'll make sure ah. that uh, if they find any kind of dead body it's uh, it's fair game in fact there's a bit of um so that's what happened to footage. enya when she was singing orinoco flow i mean that's why we've never yeah, heard the, of her since i was gonna say yeah she sort of disappeared in the mid 90s so that's fair enough yeah um <laughs> so fair enough reason i i don't know if that's exactly what happened to her but um yeah they are a really really uh incredibly effective cleanup crew for the uh, the amazon um and in fact, there's there's a bit of video footage uh, that was able to find on YouTube um, that's certainly worth looking at. And that's someone feeding them in a aquarium somewhere in Asia. So I've never actually seen these um, in any captive situation, but they were feeding them a pig's head. And they were doing pretty much the same thing. How cool uh, would that be? To have that as very, an aquarium very cool, attraction. Very cool to watch uh, as these things basically bore into the side of a pig's head. So they're 
far cooler in in my mind than um, than a lot of these uh, well smaller often, ones. That oftentimes, that's the, the case, uh, the isn't reputation. it? The reality is is better than the myth. Well, yeah, and catfish, and I'm a big fan of catfish. Have got some really bizarre adaptations all over the world, and that's me uh, going on about catfish for more than long enough. I think I'm more of, more of a dogfish <laughs> person. <laughs> I'm more of a <laughs> dick fish. Um... Oh dear! That brings us to the end of our creature feature for this week. So hopefully we'll come up with some equally bizarre creature feature for next week, uh, and we will now go on to our next. Our next topic, which is our pop culture corner, where we're going to be looking at anything and everything animal science based um, that's got to do with pop culture. <clears throat> so onwards to that. OK, well, we're now into pop culture corner, which is our little way of looking out at all the things that are floating around there. Whether it be um, random random things that I want to buy, random things that I want to go and see at the cinema, much <laughs> of seeing things at the cinema at the moment, um, or just things that have popped up to do with uh, pop culture and animals. Um, for our first segment on this, uh, Aaron, you've got something. Why don't you take it away? Uh, yeah, I think somebody has been drunk over the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the course of it sounds like you're drunk at the moment. We didn't start drinking. <laughs> yeah, I, sorry. <laughs> so, so Pepper's been a bit of... Take a second and calm yourself down. <laughs> <laughs> right, so February's been a bit of an exciting one, it seems, for Sam Neill <laughs> on the set of Jurassic World Dominion, which is the sixth film in the franchise. It is. Wow, that's... <laughs> Didn't honestly think of that. So, that makes you feel old. It does it? make me feel old because I remember seeing the first one when it came out, and I was about nine. I saw it in the cinema. Yeah. Yeah. So he started off the month by saying that by claiming that Jeff Goldblum drove everyone crazy. <laughs> I think he probably does. In my, in my Jeff Goldblum to... is essentially just Ian Malcolm. That's just exactly how I see him in real life. Basically. He just kept coming up with ideas on the fly and trying to convince everyone to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> he then Sitting falls in the corner aside. laughing whilst with his shirt open. Uh. Now, let me... For those of you that don't know, Sam Neill, of course, is famous for playing the, um, the parody of Odin in For Ragnarok. <laughs> um, yes, that's what he's most famous for, I think. Yes. He's well known. <laughs> and that's, that's got everything to do with natural history and, uh, and science. <laughs> 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 he also plays in a slightly smaller role Alan Grant in the Jurassic Park franchise oh, I don't in know which that. he stars in arguably the best film in the franchise Jurassic Park and the worst film in the franchise Jurassic Park 3 we'll always disagree which... on that one I, I don't hate that film I, I respect the worst <laughs> no I, I agree with Aaron we're taking over this podcast now Gareth <laughs> I'm always going to get outvoted on Jurassic Park. It's the sequel trilogy of the Jurassic Park franchise. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he follows up his 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 uh, Jeff Goldblum uh, rant with uh, this. Was it was it a rant or was it just like statement. an off comment? Sorry, I'm more interested in that now. Well, you know, like <laughs> a bit of a it was a bit of a sarcastic joke, I think. Really. All oh, right. Okay. He follows us up by saying Jurassic Park Three is pretty damn good, which I think is high praise for fertilizer. Um, <laughs> it's uh, I think that's a crime to say that, really. Actually, Mister Neil. Anyway, he then followed this up just a couple days ago by saying they sh they shot a six hour movie Jurassic. World Dominion is a six-hour movie. I would watch. Now he's not saying that the movie hours. itself is six hours. He's just saying that they they filmed six like they filmed a six-hour movie. Who's, who's Can you direct... believe that he's seventy-three years old? Who's directing this one? Uh, I mean, he's done well. Seventy-three. Um, yeah, I who is believe this it's one? Colin Trevorrow, the one who's supposed then to. I'm, uh, I'm going to insist. He was they... supposed to do episode nine of Star Wars, and then that all went down the toilet. I'm going to insist that they uh, they release the Trevorrow cut, all six hours of it. 
<laughs> so he, he's quoted as saying, it's going to be a big film. Colin Trevorrow has a childlike sense of wonder, playfulness and inventiveness that Spielberg has. Now, if I remember correctly, um, <clears throat> Sam Neill also spilt beans on the fact that there's going to be Giganotosaurus in this yes. one. I think yeah, I do it was remember a... that. Sam Neill is a bit like the Tom Holland of the Jurassic Park franchise. The, these two just can't seem to keep their mouth shut. If you want stuff spoiled about the movie coming up, <laughs> go to Tom it. Holland or uh, Sam Neill. <laughs> <laughs> so then he says, we really shot a six-hour movie. We were all very gung-ho. Hopefully there will be m- thousands of massive cinemas ready for it uh, because, because it's a big film for big audiences. Yeah, I can't imagine seeing a Jurassic park film for the first time and it not being in the cinema but the way the world is at the moment who knows well so yeah that's uh so yeah the six hours of uh of jurassic park in one movie Uh, obviously it's not going to be six hours long which is which is a shame because i would like it is a shame i would i would watch it 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 depends on the quality of uh of those six hours because if it's anything like the (laughs) fallen kingdom I wouldn't want to watch six minutes slap, of that again. Let's just slap an audible or an audio uh, spoiler warning here, um, just to prove my point. Uh, Sam Neill continues, It's the same character, but different world, different times. Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler haven't seen each other for some time, so you'll see how that pans out. Now, I was assuming, and I think many other people were assuming, that they would actually be back together in this one. Well, not really, because she uh, had a chance of another yeah, no, she, yeah. Yes, but there's two two things with that. Firstly, why would they bring these two back together? And secondly, Jurassic Park three doesn't doesn't count. <laughs> Fair enough. In your in your movie <laughs> universe, you've just deleted that third film. Well, actually, I, to be I fair, have, they I have erased it. They have uh, in the Jurassic World films. They have sort of retconned, haven't they? From they um, have an awful lot of from stuff. two and yeah. three. Which I have never to really say, fitted them in, but. <clears throat> Either One way. of my favourite things in Jurassic... So in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, I love the fact that they kind of loop back and try to adopt the Lost World back in, because even though Jurassic Park's the best movie, the Lost World's my favourite. But it is because they mentioned Sauna, Jurassic yeah. World, <clears throat> they mention Sauna, they mention like a few things that happened there. And also, this new movie has a bit about Sauna in it, apparently, uh, from some photo leaks. Anyway, what I love oh, okay. about Jurassic World is when they open and bring out Rexy, the first thing she does is break a Sam Spinosaurus. <laughs> Your hatred of Spinosaurus, <laughs> it's just not right. But we'll talk about Sp- uh, Spinosaurus more because there's always Spinosaurus in the news. When it there comes is. To he's, that. He's, they're getting quite interesting now. <laughs> yeah, the fascinating development in how yeah. we understand what Spinosaurus is. But that's for another time. Oh. Yeah, so yeah. when the next update comes, which will probably be tomorrow. Well, yeah, the, the rev- when we the find out Spinosaurus ending. fin was actually just fused wings. Yeah, they were flying. I'm joking. That is that is not what its fin was. <laughs> what its sail was. Well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know yet. We don't know. And one it's day, you might even get you two liking Spinosaurus. I like. I, I, I don't, don't dislike like it. The I don't like the film. That's what I don't like. I don't like the film. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. dislike the animal and, uh, at all. I didn't like it way before the Spinosaurus appeared. I didn't like it from the moment that that raptor turns up in the airplane and goes, Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Talking raptors, it's the best thing. So we'll move on. I mean, they were clever. We'll move, we'll, we'll move on from our pop culture corner there mm. um, and leave you ranting about Sam Neill uh, and uh, his, his like of his own film. <laughs> and we'd normally... Well, I say normally, this being the first episode, we'd go into our mailbag. Aaron, is there anything in the mailbag? Um, no. <laughs> no, because we haven't got any mail because, well, this is the first episode. So <laughs> if you want to get in contact with the podcast and let Aaron and Drew know uh, your love for Spinosaurus and how wrong they are, and that Jurassic Park 3 <laughs> itself is not a bad film. Mm. It has its good merits. Yeah, don't, don't bother mailing. <laughs> <laughs> We don't want you. Don't bother meddling them, apparently. Um, But you can get... The vocal cords, the raptor vocal cords. Oh, my God. You can get in contact with the podcast by emailing us at thenathistorycupboard at gmail.com and uh, let us know what you think. 
Uh, but that pretty much brings us to an end of our first ever episode. So how are you feeling, you two, after us uh, just just ploughing through this? So, I so really it's enjoyed the experience. <laughs> it's been amazing. And I'm particularly glad that no one has called us over the radio or even just knocked on the door shouting, do you want your <laughs> parcel? They'll, ca- they'll come Amazon for you at some point. Uh, the, uh, the delivery drivers will find you at some point. Yeah. yeah. Either that or Jude will. Well, yeah. Anyway. It's, uh, it's been emotional. Well, we'll hopefully have you two back with us uh, next time, which uh, we'll try and uh, and try and bring you more insane, bizarre, disgusting, and not as many drug-filled hippos. Uh, but uh, yeah. hopefully that will be the, uh, the Nat History Cupboard for now. So we'll see you next time. Bye.